We know the government wastes money. But what was some of the most ridiculous wasted spending this year? What's in the news was stories on murder by cop. Cops brag about legal hemp bust. Three death row men exonerated. State won't test DNA for dead death row inmate. Proposed law will stop kids from defending themselves with guns. And a man charged with theft for taking the cop's GPS tracker off of his car. And an Ask Me Anything where I answer your questions on the worst book I've ever read. Fuck, Mary Kill, Mark Clare, Johnny Rocket, Chris Spangle. Favorite Thanksgiving dishes, impeachment, documentaries, public school, and homesteading. This episode is brought to you by Health Excellence Plus, a health share that has saved my family thousands of dollars and can save you money too. Also brought to you by ForkFest, the annual decentralized libertarian camping event that happens around ForkFest, with no tickets and no one in charge. Also brought to you by all of my dozens of supporters. Welcome to The Lava Flow. Channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week from the home state of snow, where I just spent nearly two hours blowing snow off of my long-ass driveway. This is the show where I shoot from the lip to bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Rebellion needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 146, Wasteful Spending 2019, and it's Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019, when there have already been more than 829 people killed by police this year, and the United States debt clock shows us at more than $23 trillion, $87 billion, $700 million in debt. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. Love him or hate him, and frankly, depending on the day, I can do both. But Rand Paul always kills it with his yearly waste report. This year is no different. He brought to light a ton of new wasteful spending, and it is too rich and juicy to pass up. First up, the federal government spent $22 million last year on a local development grant used, in part, to subsidize the production of Sajinica cheese, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which is a creamy white cheese produced only in the rural highlands of southwest Serbia, with the goal of raising production standards so the cheese can be sold in the European Union and the United States. U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, said the project will help standardize Sajinica cheese production by teaching farmers in the region about the problems created by questionable practices, such as adding water or baking powder to the milk or skimming the fat. Professional Serbian cheese production might be a boon to local farmers by opening up export markets for their products. But it's difficult to imagine why American taxpayer dollars should be directed toward that goal. American taxpayers and dairy farmers have another good reason to be cheesed off about the questionable spending. Right now, America is experiencing something of a cheese crisis. According to the Department of Agriculture, the United States is sitting on 1.4 billion pound cheese surplus, largely due to an increase in dairy production and a decline in consumption of milk and cheese. The federal government has been buying up excess cheese to bail out the dairy farmers at the same time that it's using tax dollars to boost cheese production in the Balkans. Typical fucking government boondoggle. Unfortunately, that's not the only comical way that the federal government wasted money this year. Also earning scorn in Paul's report is the State Department's decision to buy an $84,000 statue from Bob Dylan, yes, that Bob Dylan, for the U.S. Embassy in Mozambique. Dylanists may recall that Mozambique is a goofy track from his 1975 album, Desire. But the real problem isn't the weird homage to Dylan. It's the fact that every new U.S. embassy or consulate includes an automatic budget of 0.5% of the construction cost for art acquisition. No matter how much that 0.5% might be in actual dollars, Paul's report notes, as a way to spread American soft power around the globe. The most outlandish case of wasteful spending included in the new report 
recalls previous National Institutes of Health, the NIH, outrages like the infamous Give Cocaine to Japanese Quails study or the study of dangerous behavior at dance clubs. This time around, though, the NIH spent $708,000 on a study that got zebrafish addicted to nicotine. The study, conducted in London, examined the link between genetics and addiction. And while that sort of research can certainly have its benefits, it's still pretty unclear why American taxpayers should be paying for it. Paul's report notes, Spending fewer than a million dollars may seem like a drop in the bucket compared to the hundreds of millions and billions the federal government routinely dishes out, but it all adds up to the massive budget deficits and $23 trillion national debt before us today. Other notable items in Paul's waste report include $153 million spent on the Washington Metro Area Transit Authority, one of the worst-rated transit authorities in the country. $300,000 on funding a debate and model UN competitions in Afghanistan. Almost $5 million on studying the connection between drinking alcohol and winding up in the emergency room. $16 million on improving the quality of schooling in Egypt, all the while public schooling in the U.S. is failing miserably. And finally, spending almost $34 million to buy textbooks, for Afghan students. As always, Paul goes into detail on all of these topics in his waste report. It is good reading. If you want to read it, you can find a link to it in the show notes to this episode at thelavaflow.com slash 146. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In Bad Boys News, a federal indictment says that the deadly Houston drug raid was based on lies from start to finish. The Justice Department announced that three people have been indicted on federal charges because of their roles in a fraudulent no-knock drug raid that killed a middle-aged Houston couple back in January. The indictment alleges not only that Gerald Goins, the narcotics officer who spearheaded the operation, lied in his search warrant affidavit, but that Patricia Ann Garcia, whose 911 calls prompted Goins' investigation, lied when she implicated Dennis Tuttle and Regina Nicholas in drug dealing. The upshot is that the basis for the raid was a lie from start to finish. That realization contradicts Houston Police Chief Art Avocito's insistence that there were sound reasons, apart from Goins' prevarications, to think that Tuttle and Nicholas were selling heroin. Goins, who already faced state murder charges in connection with the raid that killed Tuttle and Nicholas, has been charged with violating their Fourth Amendment rights under color of law. The Justice Department says Goins faces up to life in prison if convicted of those charges, although the statute also allows the death penalty for violations with lethal consequences. Goins, who retired in March after 34 years with the Houston Police Department, claimed in his affidavit that a confidential informant had purchased heroin from a middle-aged white male whose name is unknown at the house on Harding Street that Tuttle and Nicholas shared. But the raid, which was executed the day after that purported sale, discovered no heroin and no evidence of drug dealing. Soon afterward, Houston police investigators concluded that the confidential informant described by Goins did not exist. Goins then changed his story, claiming he had bought the heroin himself. According to the federal indictment, that was also a lie. The Justice Department says that Goins made numerous materially false statements in the state search warrant and afterward repeatedly lied about the circumstances of the raid. In addition to the civil rights charges, Goins is accused of falsifying records and obstructing an official proceeding. The indictment also charges Stephen Bryant, a Houston narcotics officer who helped back up Goins' story with obstructing justice by falsifying records. Bryant, who supposedly identified the brown powder substance that the non-existent informant never bought as black tar heroin, already faced a state charge of tampering with a governmental record. The federal charge carries a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. The biggest revelation in the indictment is that the January 8 report about drug activity at the Harding Street house was completely false. Yet, Houston Police Chief Art Avcevito has repeatedly cited that report as evidence that his department was right to investigate Tuttle and Nicholas. The 911 caller, Garcia, made up the story behind her initial call 
and is being charged with conveying false information by making several fake 911 calls, an offense punishable by up to five years in prison. Acevedo said Garcia's calls showed there was a legitimate basis for the investigation that led to the Harding Street raid. He called the home a problem location and a locally notorious drug house. He even claimed that people who lived nearby had thanked police for raiding the house. Yet, neighbors interviewed by local news outlets described Tuttle and Nicholas, who had lived on Harding Street for two decades, as perfectly nice and said they had never seen any signs of criminal activity. Look, fuck Acevedo, Goins, Bryant, and Garcia in the neck with a brown powder substance. This is one of the most disgusting miscarriages of justice I've seen to date. And Acevedo is still going to bat for these motherfuckers today. After this indictment, he said, I stand by saying we had a reason to be in that house. We had a reason to be in that house and probable cause or suspicion to be in that house. There's a reason we were there, and that will all come out in due time. Well, it's been almost a fucking year. I think you've had plenty of time, asshat. Note that Acevedo had backtracked without admitting it, shifting from probable cause to suspicion, which does not legally justify searching a home, even when the suspicion is reasonable. Look, as far as I'm concerned, these issues start at the top, and Acevedo should be facing justice as well for his complicity and his cover-up in these murders. In more Bad Boys news, the NYPD bragged about a big pop bust on social media. Turns out, it had seized 106 pounds of legal hemp. After six years in the natural medicine business, Green Angel CBD owner John D. has faced an obstacle so large that he could be forced to close his doors. That obstacle? The New York Police Department's 75th Precinct. Over the weekend, D. sent a 106-pound shipment of hemp flour from a Vermont farm via FedEx Freight. FedEx thought the $30,000 shipment might be pot, so it informed the Williston Police Department in Vermont. After investigating, the cops produced a police report showing that the company was a licensed hemp grower and that the hemp's THC content was 0.06%, well within the legal limit. The Williston police advised FedEx that it would not seize the shipment, and the hemp made its way to New York. There, a FedEx driver brought in the NYPD. As the Williston police noted, the shipment was clearly marked with all the proper documentation. But the New York officers ignored all of that documentation, seized the shipment, and staged the seizure as a drug bust on social media. The NYPD then contacted D, asking him to go to the station to pick up the shipment. D was recovering from a medical procedure, so he sent his brother, Ronan Levy, in his place. The request appeared to be a trap. After Levy walked into the station, the officers arrested him, charged him with six counts of possession, and jailed him. He has since been released without bail. At a press conference, officials said the shipment was tested as marijuana and denied that Levy had a proper bill of lading stating that shipment was hemp. D believes the officer ignored the paperwork in hopes that he had a major drug bust on his hands. D also says that the NYPD relied on an outdated field test from the 1960s. Imagine that. The test cannot differentiate between levels of THC, a key to absolving the company and Levy of any suspected crime. Because the department is still holding on to his shipment, D stands to lose a lot of money, and perhaps even his business. He wrote on Instagram, This was our shipment. My brother was falsely arrested. Those bags were all hemp. All documents were in each box. The farm also called them to give them all their paperwork, proving that it's all hemp. Please spread the word. We need to let people know we are not criminals. D and Levy are also considering legal action against both FedEx and the NYPD, as well they should. FedEx and the NYPD knew the paperwork was there. They knew things were all in order. They knew the boxes were labeled correctly. And they said, fuck it, we're going to mess up this guy's life anyway. That is willful negligence, and they should be held accountable for every penny this guy loses as a result, plus paying for his time and trouble to deal with this bullshit. As most of you know, I was laid off from my 9-to-5 director of IT job last summer. Among the many terrifying things about losing your job is losing your health benefits. 
Our family went about six months without any kind of health insurance, and the anxiety and worry that came along with that was not insignificant. But after spending dozens of hours researching our options and quickly rejecting the $2,000 a month price tag that came with the options available with traditional insurance, we found Health Excellence Plus, a health share that was a fraction of the cost, and we're glad we did. Only a few weeks after joining as members of this health share program, my wife was diagnosed with a common skin cancer that requires an expensive procedure to remove the cancer and another surgery to repair the damage done from the cancer removal. When this is all said and done, Health Excellence Plus will have saved our family thousands of dollars, and I'll bet they can save you money too. Health Excellence Plus is a health share that meets the requirements of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. A health share is a community of like-minded, health-focused members who have joined together to share each other's medical costs above an amount they can comfortably afford. A health share is not traditional health insurance. It is designed to be a catastrophic coverage for major items, like my wife's surgery. The cost of an average family insurance policy for a primary 45 years old with a $5,000 deductible is $1,450 per month. A Health Excellence Plus $500 initial and shareable amount with a health care strategy is only $783. Get started saving money today at thelavaflow.com slash health. That's thelavaflow.com slash health. In Innocence News, after 36 years in prison for the Georgetown Jacket murders, three men are exonerated at last. In November 1983, 14-year-old DeWitt Duckett was shot in the neck in a Baltimore high school over his Georgetown starter jacket. Three 16-year-old boys were arrested on Thanksgiving Day 1983 and charged with the murder. Alfred Chestnut, Ransom Watkins, and Andrew Stewart were convicted and sentenced to life in prison. The three, now in their 50s, were all released from prison on Monday, fully exonerated after spending 36 years incarcerated for a murder they didn't commit. Baltimore Circuit Court Judge Charles Peters said, On behalf of the criminal justice system, and I'm sure this means very little to you, I'm going to apologize. Boy, that's big of him. People in the courtroom erupted in applause as he declared them innocent. In May, Chestnut had written a letter to Baltimore State Attorney Marilyn Mosby, along with evidence incriminating the man now believed to have been the actual shooter, and asked for her office's Conviction Integrity Unit to re-examine the case as a wrongful conviction. Investigators re-interviewed witnesses and looked anew at the evidence, and Mosby's office says the findings were troubling. Witnesses were coached and coerced by investigators to say they'd seen the three, after twice failing to pick them out of a lineup. Witnesses identified a different young person as the shooter, but police instead focused on Chestnut, Watkins, and Stewart. Defense attorneys had asked for evidence that might exonerate their clients, but prosecutors had said they had none. The man now suspected of committing the murder was shot to death in 2002. The exonerations bring to nine the number of people freed since 2015 owing to the efforts of the Conviction Integrity Unit, a division dedicated to uncovering wrongful convictions. The unit works in partnership with the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project and the University of Baltimore's Innocence Project Clinic. These folks are doing the Lord's work right here, for real. In related news, a Tennessee court is refusing to test DNA evidence that could exonerate a man that the state already executed. We've talked about several cases lately where people on death row could be exonerated by DNA evidence the different states have refused to test. One in Georgia was also executed with evidence completely untested. This one is a bit closer to home since it happened about 20 minutes from where I lived for 40 years. A technicality in the law stands in the way of a daughter's attempt to prove that the state of Tennessee put her innocent father to death. Sedley Alley was convicted of the 1985 rape and murder of Marine Corporal Suzanne M. Collins. Collins was jogging in a park near a naval base in Millington when she was abducted. Three witnesses said her abductor was driving a brown station wagon. Alley drove a similar vehicle. He was pulled over and told naval security that he was driving around town and drinking beer the night of the abduction. Allie was brought in for questioning on the naval base. When the questioning was completed, Allie started his vehicle so he could leave. 
The witnesses, who happened to be present, said the sound of his car matched the sound of the perpetrator's vehicle. Collins's mutilated body was discovered the next day, and law enforcement arrested Allie. Allie confessed to the murder and led police to the crime scene. However, there are several problems with the state's case. The Innocence Project, a civil liberties group, now believes that Allie was coerced into making a false confession by the police. An expert would later testify that police tainted Allie's confession by telling him non-public details about the case. The group also notes inconsistencies with the evidence used to convict Allie. The witness description of the suspect did not match Allie's features. Allie's supposed recollection of the crime also did not match up with the details uncovered by investigators. In fact, he repeatedly said that he did not remember committing the crime. Allie was executed by lethal injection in June of 2006. April Allie, his daughter, is now working with the Innocence Project to clear her father's name posthumously. The Innocence Project has called for testing physical evidence from the case, which includes a red underwear believed to be owned by the assailant and stains on Collins's shirt and bra. The group received information about another possible suspect, a man who attended the same training school as Collins. They believe that this man, most recently indicted for homicide and rape in St. Louis, is a serial offender. Judge Paula Scahan dismissed a petition to clear the deceased's name. Scahan's opinion says that April Alley does not have standing as Alley's estate to file a petition for post-conviction DNA testing of evidence held by the state. Clearly, truth and justice means absolutely nothing to this judge. Scahan's decision rests on Tennessee's Post-Conviction DNA Analysis Act of 2001, which merely allows a person convicted of and sentenced for the commission of first-degree murder to file a petition of this nature. The cruel irony of this legal predicament is that Allie, who is deceased because of the state's actions, is the only person who has the authority to file a petition asking the state to test the evidence that could exonerate him. Look, if states are going to murder people, and frankly, they should not. But if they are, they should at least make 100% sure that 100% of the evidence is 100% tested before doing the act. And if there is ever a question about someone they did murder being innocent, they should be doing everything possible to show that they had a reason to murder the individual, especially if what they're really interested in is justice. But the government doesn't work that way. I had the awesome pleasure of joining liberty-minded voluntarists, anarchists, and libertarians for the third annual Fork Fest in June in the beautiful White Mountains of New Hampshire, and I had a blast. I've now been to all three Fork Fests, and I don't plan on missing a single one. This year, the event at least tripled in size from last year, with tons more people there and several food vendors. Fork Fest is a decentralized camping event where no one is in charge. This means there is no ticket cost to attend the event. This also means that you are free to create whatever experience or event you want or would like others to enjoy. You can connect with other Fork Festers via the unofficial Telegram chat or the Fork Fest forum at the unofficial website forkfest.party. That's forkfest.party. Keep an eye out for the dates for next year's event, which will likely be in late June. I hope to see you at Fork Fest next year. In Do It For The Children news, a Virginia bill proposes a law that outlaws minors using guns to fend off home invaders. How old does one have to be in order to protect their life from imminent danger? That may seem like a silly question, and it is. But based upon certain bills being proposed by Democratic legislatures, it is a legitimate one that has to be answered. The reason being is that if a new bill passes in Virginia, a person might not be able to protect themselves by an accessible firearm unless they're 18 years old. After Democrats managed to take control of the legislature in Virginia, gun control has been the main agenda for the party while enjoying the leisure of the majority vote. While legislators seek to enforce more tight and universal background checks and other gun control laws while within office, as usual, they have given attention to age restrictions on access to firearms. One such bill is SB 18, Firearms, which includes language associated with criminal history record information checks and, most importantly, age requirements with regard to handling firearms. 
Under this bill, it will be a Class 1 misdemeanor to allow a child to use firearms unless under parental supervision. Essentially, what this bill means is that in the event your child is in danger, regardless of their age and knowledge of handling firearms properly, any criminal who has the intent to do them harm can do so and they'll be left helpless from a legal standpoint. The bill does not even bother to take into consideration whether the child has adequate firearm training or if the child is 17 years old. The law simply instructs parents and guardians to lock away every single firearm in their absence, thus leaving the fate of the child to the mercy of any burglars who decides to pay your home a visit while the parent is away. There's simply no logic being applied with regard to the bill being proposed. And there's no reason why a competent minor cannot use a firearm to protect their life. There are plentiful instances of children as young as 11 years old standing their ground and using weapons against burglars in the absence of the parent. If this bill passes, parents will have to decide whether to risk facing criminal charges for affording their children the ability to protect themselves or gamble with the lives of their children in the event that calamity strikes when they're not around. Fuck this lawmaker in the neck with the business end of a rifle. My children know how to use every single gun in our home, and they have been extensively trained on gun safety. I have no doubt that my 11 and 13-year-old boys would be able to defend themselves with these weapons if they needed to, and I have told them over and over again to do so if necessary. In what the actual fuck news, cops put a GPS tracker on a man's car, then charged him with theft after he found it and removed it. A little more than a year ago, the state of Indiana charged a suspected drug dealer with theft for removing a government-owned GPS tracking device from his SUV. This month, the state's Supreme Court began considering the case, and some justices seemed skeptical of the government's argument. Justice Stephen David said, I'm really struggling with how is that theft. The case began in July 2018 when the Warwick County Sheriff's Office got a warrant to attach a GPS tracking device to Derek Huring's car. Information from a confidential informant had led them to believe that Huring was using the vehicle to sell meth. The GPS device transmitted data for a little more than a week. Then it stopped. Officers suspected Huring had discovered and removed it. After waiting another 10 days to see if it would start working again, Detectives applied for a warrant to search Hearing's home and a nearby property belonging to Hearing's parents. U.S. law requires law enforcement to show probable cause that a crime has been committed before engaging in a search. In this case, police said they suspected that Hearing had committed the crime of theft by taking the GPS device. Police did find the tracking device. They also found methamphetamine and drug paraphernalia, evidence that police say show that Hearing had been dealing drugs. So Hearing was charged both with drug dealing and with theft of the GPS device. At trial, Hearing's legal team argued that the search had been illegal because the police didn't have probable cause to believe their client had committed theft. The defense pointed out that the device could have fallen off the car by accident or simply malfunction. Even if Hearing did take the device off the vehicle, he couldn't have known for sure that it belonged to the government. It wasn't exactly labeled as the property of the Warwick County Sheriff's Office. Most important, it's not clear that taking an unwanted device off of your car is theft, even if you know who it belongs to. Justice David said, If somebody wants to find me to do harm to me, and it's not the police, and they put a tracking device on my car and I find a tracking device, and I dispose of it after stomping on it 25 times, I would hope they would not be able to go to a local prosecutor and somehow then I'm getting charges filed against me for destroying someone else's property. No shit. If someone attached something to my car, they better goddamn well expect that to now be my property. They have forfeited their right to own it by attaching it to my property. Ask me anything. Roger will answer your questions about, well, anything. Do you have a question for Roger? Email AMA at thelavaflow.com or add your question to the latest AMA thread in the Pax Libertas Productions Facebook group. It's that time again. I'm going to answer your burning questions. Remember, you can ask me your question by adding it to the thread that I post in the Pax Libertas Productions podcast fans Facebook group or by emailing me at AMA at thelavaflow.com. Or if you are awesome as fuck and you support this show, you can ask me your question in the Lava Flow Super Supporters Facebook group or in Patreon. 
So let's jump into the questions. We will start with questions from Daryl W. Perry, who never fails to deliver. First, he asks, what's the worst book you have ever read and what made it so bad? I have to say the Twilight series of books by Stephanie Meyer. I mean, damn, they were hard to read. Terrible writing, terrible dialogue, ridiculous stories. Just shit in a book cover. I bought the series for Jess when she was in the hospital, and and I was so bored, so I picked them up too. Do not do it. Daryl's next question is, Fuck in the neck, Mary kill. Mark Clare, Johnny Rocket, Chris Spangle. Well, shit. Daryl, you really suck for asking this question. I mean, no matter how I answer it, I'm going to piss one of them off, or hell, all three of them for that matter. Some days, I want to kill Spangle, but... Frankly, lately, he is becoming much more voluntarious than I ever thought possible. Maybe me giving him so much shit over the last several years has helped. I certainly hope so. Mark Clare has a beautiful mane of hair, but frankly, I'm more into brunettes. And I couldn't imagine being married to the hard-partying Johnny. What a riot. So, I guess if you held a gun to my head, I guess I would have to say that I would fuck Spangle in the neck since I've been threatening to do that for years. And, frankly, I do appreciate more cushion for the pushing. I would marry Mark, since he looks the most like a girl, and maybe I could pretend. And I would kill Johnny, just, frankly, because his liver is likely going to do him in soon anyway. Guys, please don't hate me for that. Daryl also asked, favorite Thanksgiving dishes? Now, I am a huge ham lover, since pork is my favorite meat, but I do also enjoy turkey. We fried a turkey with Cajun injection for Friendsgiving this past weekend with some very special people, and it was awesome. I'm not much into the traditional things like dressing and cranberry crap. Just give me the meats, and I am happy. Although I do love some deviled eggs, especially when they come from our own chickens. Daryl asked more questions that I will get to next week as well. The next question is from Mark W., longtime friend and supporter of the show. He asks... Should impeachment stop with just President Trump, or can we somehow find a way to impeach the entire damn state while we're at it? I say impeach all the bastards and replace them with nothing. Let them eat their own. If only. Next one up is from Robert C. He asks, Since you mostly watch documentaries, which ones do you recommend? And I certainly do have a love of the documentary form of movie. Some of the best that I've seen are Citizen Four about Edward Snowden. It was so well done. I bought this one on Blu-ray. I loved it so much. The Internet's Own Boy about Aaron Swartz. What an incredibly sad story. Derek J's Victimless Crime Spree, since I know all of the principal characters on this show very well. The Paradise Lost Trilogy, since I was living in West Memphis during all of that and knew most of the people involved very well. Making a Murder, of course, is an incredibly well done documentary. And so many more. I could go on for days with this list, but I think that's a pretty good start. Next up is Drake L. He asks, What would you do if your children want to go to public schools, or if they grew up very statist in general? Well, frankly, if my children wanted to go to public school, I would tell them fine, but they have to find their own way to school them back. I refuse to participate in something like that. Thankfully, my children love being unschooled, so I never have to worry about it. If they grew up statist, I would just disown them. Problem solved. I'm joking, of course. I think. Drake also has a couple of more questions, and I'm going to hold on to those till next week. Sejus B asks, Since starting homesteading, what has been your favorite skill to learn and your least favorite skill to learn, and why? Oh man, I love so much about homesteading. I love working with animals so much, knowing that I'm giving them a great life until that one bad day, and learning so much about them has just been fantastic. Knowing that I'm supplying my family with excellent food that has been cared for and fed properly makes it all worthwhile. I've also loved learning how to build things. I've never built anything in my life out of wood until last year. Now I've built five greenhouse tables, a 20-foot by 6-foot chicken run, a 6-foot workbench, a 9-foot tall, 8-foot wide, 2-foot deep set of shelves for holding all of our supplies, and a bench for sitting and watching our chickens. Next up this winter is building a second workbench, since I've already outgrown my first one, building another set of shelves to go with my two workbenches, building a new type of chicken tractor and some sort of pig enclosure shelter, building a roadside egg store to sell our eggs on the honor system on the highway. 
a rain harvesting system for our chicken run that we built, and more benches in our chicken watching bench style for other places on the homestead, including building tables to go beside those. Lots to do this winter for sure. I guess my least favorite new skill to learn was the actual killing of the chickens. It's not pleasant, to be sure, but it is a necessary part of the process. And it did get easier as I went along. After doing 13 birds this year, we're hoping to do 100 next year, and adding at least two pigs as well that I will, of course, dispatch myself, so I better get used to it fast. I think the hard part's going to be the pigs, since they are so much more intelligent, cute, and will have them longer, so it'll be easier to get attached to them. But damn, I want some bacon. Guys, thank you so much for all of your questions. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite shelf builder, Jessica, for her help with this show. For the show notes to this episode, where I put links and other information that's been on the show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 146. I have a new supporter this week. Lee C. became a $5 per month supporter at thelavaflow.com slash support. Thank you so much, Lee. So thanks to Lee and all of my awesome supporters, I am at $244.75 per episode, or 49% of the way towards my next goal of $50 per episode. Thank you for all your support, guys, really. Remember, when I hit this next goal, I'll be upping the content I bring you from half an hour per week to a full hour. I know you want more content from me, and I want to give it to you. So add your pledge today to help me bring you twice the lava flow that you're getting today. So exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a donation of as little as a buck a week using Federal Reserve notes through my site or using cryptocurrencies through Bitbacker. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. I also have a new review this week. Walker 89 says, Top Notch. Stumbled upon this podcast and have been listening nonstop to catch up. Best podcast I've ever listened to. Holy shit, R. Walker. Thank you so much for that awesome review, man. If you have a minute and you want to hear your review read right here on the show, please go to thelavaflow.com slash apple and leave me a rating and a review. All the cool kids are doing it, like R. Walker. Thank you to everyone who's left me a rating and a review so far. You guys rock. To all of you who haven't, can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to thelavaflow.com slash apple to do that now. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast. <laughs>